We are back live. Round two. Round two. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we already got some really awesome comments. Thanks, everybody, for for doing that, keeping keeping engaged. It's good. So It's a very good thing. Brian and I are back from... Can you see how tan we are? We just got back from Cuba on Sunday. They led us back into the country. Amazingly. I think they I were mean, ready for us to leave, quite honestly. Matt. We did have fun. The bus seemed extra fast. <laughs> <on the way>. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's okay. We cleared customs good time. in record time. Um, no, we had a we had a wonderful trip down there. And yeah. Matt's Fantastic. first saltwater experience. Yeah. Uh, I only so took 2,000 photos. So what did you think of it, Matt? You want to uh, tell I everybody? can't wait to go back. Um what a cool place. I mean, you get a little bit of cultural time, you know, getting to interact with the people of Cuba, and they were super wonderful. I mean, nothing but wonderful people down there, and such an enormous area to explore and fish and not see anyone else, and obviously the cars were really cool. Um, right. I mean, You know, they great. do such a great job with managing the, the flats and the conservation down there, but I think... You know, I'm not a big cigar smoker, but that that evening we had that was cool with Boris with the cigars we'll remember and, the, that and the chocolate and the rum. It was pretty special. Yeah, yeah. that was fun. Yeah, I can't well, wait to go again. So Bonefish uh, fight hard. Yeah, they do. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Super fun. I didn't get a permit this year. Nobody did. The weather was a little bit a no. uh, little bit suspect, but we had a good time. But tonight we are really excited to have Kevin Feenstra once again. Uh, tying with us. Yeah, and super happy to have Kevin in house again. Uh, this guy always shows up and shares probably too much knowledge. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Kevin is a consummate gentleman, and um, you know somebody that I've known as, as basically as long as I've been guiding. I think, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, hails from the Muskegon River, where he does specializes in swing fishing and uh, does a lot of smallmouth trips as well. So we're super happy to have Kevin here tonight. Um, um, we do have from last week. Yeah, we uh, since we were in such a big hurry to leave for Cuba, I do apologize to everyone who was diligent and filled out the proper paperwork because you know the six P's, right, Brian? I don't. Tell proper me preparation prevents piss poor performance. So. Ah. That's uh, so Kevin's Kevin's working Ke this Kevin's through. Counting. Six of them. <laughs> Is it six? Did I hit six? I hope so. <laughs> Whatever. I'm no mathematician. Well, <laughs> don't make me do math. Anyways, we forgot to announce who won the uh, the Loon UV fly tying kit from tying live with uh, with Johnny with Ray. Johnny Ray. So. I'll let Brian uh, Scott announce. Borchelt. Really uh, cool. Scott so. is the winner. We will be sending this out to you. Scott, thanks for, and thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for everybody. For participating in this. Uh, we're, we're super happy to do this. It's a lot of work. Uh, Matt is definitely the, the brains behind all this uh, here in Studio A. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it's is the like, AV club. It, it is, is definitely the, we geek out on this. Um, it's fun. And it but is we can have such great guests. It's hard not to. So we're lucky to have some amazing people willing to share all this info around here. And Kevin has uh, very generously offered a little bit of a giveaway yeah. for this episode so, as well. So tonight so. we are giving away one of Kevin's Matching Bait Fish books. Uh, it's a great book. Um, you know, we refer to it quite a bit. A lot of the tires do um, that yeah, we have Yeah, I mean, here. it's such a great reference. You should have this on your desk. You should, I mean, probably not in your fishing bag but you know if you want to like i mean do it so i will i will get on this um as brian and kevin are talking a little bit i'm gonna put up the form same thing as last week uh or the week before you know i i kind of didn't crush the proper pre preparation on that one i'll i'll own that and just put your email in this will close at midnight and we'll announce the the winner when we get a chance how about that Perfect. I'm giving myself a little bit of leeway there. So you should. You He's should. Like, <laughs> I'm still exhausted from the trip. So yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, I know you're a, an avid wildlife photographer, right? So after we did this session with you last year, you were going to go to the UP yeah. and uh, and and film snowy owls. Was it? 
That was the idea, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then and then what happened on that adventure? Uh, well, I rolled up to the UP. I was having a really nice morning. You know, it was the time of the year that the fishing wasn't too great, so I do a lot of wildlife stuff. I really enjoy it. And uh, I got up there, saw probably a dozen owls, uh, really a lot of owls. And then, uh, but my truck had been having some problems, and... Uh, um, basically, it started to stall while I was driving, and I thought, you know, I, it's a Toyota Tacoma with 270,000 miles, solid as a rock, but I think I better go home. And so uh, I rolled all the way home. It stalled a few times, and then when I finally had it home, uh, it was completely dead, and as I understood it from the uh, dealership, it was completely unrepairable without a serious investment. So... So that was the last uh, last grand finale for that truck, and uh, I was just happy to be home before it finally uh, gave out for good. So. Perfect. So how do you get all those great shots of the wildlife that you post on, like, your social media? Yeah. Because you really do have, like, some incredible shots. Um, do, do you carry cameras with you at all times? I do, but usually uh, a lot of what it is is kind of like guiding where you're... Uh, fishing and you see something that you want to explore the next time you're out by yourself and uh you know if i see a animal that's habitually in the same area i try to scheme a way that i can um just kind of hang or uh, set up something that i can wait for it to come back and a lot of times it works out you know you find that especially with birds they're very much creatures of habit and uh so you can uh can wait them out and and hopefully you get something cool and there's certain times of the year where they get concentrated just like our fish do if there's a lot of food um, that's especially true in the spring when there's um, things like suckers spawning and a lot of steelhead and salmon fry in the water um, the birds like to eat the same things that the fish do or for example at this time of the year when there's birds that are feeding on stoneflies that are crawling out of the water um, you know a lot of people don't realize it but if you want to know when midges and stoneflies are hatching on your local river, just look out at the bank when there's snow on it. And if you see a whole bunch of birds approaching the bank, you know, uh, that's a pretty good indicator that there's stoneflies and it's a good thing to put on your line for trout or steelhead or whatever you're fishing for. So well, I always do that with the cedar waxwings, uh, uh, you know, during the mayfly and caddis hatches. Yep. So, yeah, definitely. Yep. Well, what are we tying tonight, Kevin? Well, I'm going to tie a handful of flies, just things that I've been doing uh, this fall. Uh, you know, every fall is different, and so even though there's a lot of carryover from year to year patterns, because the runs are different, the quality of the fish and how they come in the river, usually I end up just tying different stuff. A lot of times it's just subtly different from the previous year, and other times it's quite a bit different. Uh, you know, this year our steelhead have been... Um, you know, we've had kind of a moderate run in the Muskegon, but the quality of the fish has been running big. And a lot like trout, if you have a run where the fish are a little bit on the big side, you tend to tie at least some of your flies are on the big side as well. And that's kind of what this first fly is going to be. So fantastic. So fantastic. I'm going to, um, uh, tie this first one. Um, uh, when I first kind of started swinging flies, it was by accident. I, basically tied a sculpin. I was fishing for smallmouth. I caught a steelhead on a big sculpin pattern, and I came up with a fly called uh, Emulator, which was kind of one of my first... That was definitely your foundation fly. Foundation fly, and, uh, you know, I still have that fly in my box, but it uh, needed an update, and so uh, I started tying, fooling around with some of the same materials and just changing some things to synthetic, and uh, this fly kind of emerged. It's a good fly to swing. It certainly works as a strip fly as well. Um, I was running out of names. Somebody asked me what to call it, and I said I was tying these code breaker flies, and I thought, well, it's bigger. We'll call it a toad breaker. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I like it. <laughs> it's uh, that's where we're at with this one. So I like it. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys how to do it. It's actually a pretty simple fly, but it, and it's a chunky fly. I used synthetic materials for the head so that it would be a little bit easier to cast than my old emulator, which had a big Australian possum head, which is still a great way to do it, but the synthetic sinks a little bit better. 
and it, it casts a little bit easier so um, so that's what we're gonna do with that so um, this is gonna be tied on a shank it's a 55 millimeter shank which is a pretty long shank uh, it's about as long as you can typically find it at most places and it's a really good length it's very comparable to uh, a straight streamer hook in a lot of ways so this one has an up eye but if you have down eye shanks that would be fine too and this fly would certainly work well on a hook too although you might run out of real estate uh, with this fly so so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys how to do this you know anybody that's seen me tie before knows that I tend to use braided loops some of the newer braid that I found is really stiff which works well for this because it doesn't foul um, for a lot of these bigger flies, I use 80 pound braid because I'm going to use a pretty big trailing hook. Um, and uh, if I if I tie smaller flies or if I try to tie flies that I want the trout to be able to eat so I can run a smaller hook, uh, I'll use 60 pounds. So, and uh, the color is your choice. You know the the 80 pound I'm using is green, and ideally I'd probably use red because it's a little easier to see if you tie an olive fly. You know. <laughs> And pick it out but uh, but uh, I'm gonna show you guys how I prep for a fly like this first and um, you know, if you've seen me didn't do this before bear with me but I'm just gonna take a piece of this braid okay if you're using big scissors uh, or really good scissors you want to use the back of your scissors because that'll wear out a scissors about as quickly as anything and this piece of braid probably about eight inches long or so and I'm going to fold it in half like that. Okay, see how I've got a loop? And then I'm just going to take my finger and I'm going to make an overhand knot. Okay, just like that. Okay, and now I'm just going to take this for just a minute. I'm going to set it aside and I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. But I'm going to set it aside and I'm going to take my thread. Uh, you want to use some heavy duty thread, the color is not so important. Um, you know, I don't typically worry too much about color, but if you only have one color to choose from, a lighter color is nice. You can always take a Sharpie or another permanent marker and uh, mark it up with whatever color you want if you use a light enough color. But I'm using yellow, and uh, all I'm going to do, the foundation to any good fly, is to cover the hook with, or the shank with thread in this case, okay? And I'm going to bring this up to the front third of the hook and I'll leave a gap at the front that's where the massive head of a sculpin is going to be. Sculpins tend to be kind of if you think about them they're kind of a teardrop shape from head to tail. They don't have any scales so fish really like to eat them. Um, they're pretty much any of our rivers that have rocks have sculpins uh, especially if there's good water quality in those rivers. So so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this here sculpin. I'm going to I'm going to place a pair of bead chain eyes, in this case they're copper, there's just two of them there, and I'm going to tie them underneath the hook, underneath this shank. Uh, you, you probably could, as this fly looks pretty similar from the top and from the bottom, you could certainly tie it in either way, but I tend to put them on the bottom of the hook just out of habit because a lot of flies I do try to t tip over so that the hook rides up. So. So now that we've covered this first part, I am going to take a, this loop that we just made. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that loop and I'm going to put it right through the eye of the hook from underneath. All right, like so. You guys can kind of see I've got the loop and I'm going to try to extend it so that that loop is just big enough so that there's about a hook's worth behind the loop. And the reason I do that is when I put, finally put this hook on the end, it has to have enough room so that I can loop to loop that hook. And it'll make sense to you, especially if you've ever made one where you made the loop too small and you only had hooks that were too big. Right. <laughs> I've done that. Which, is, which you can kind of, at least you can go and buy some bigger hook or smaller hooks, but uh, what's even worse is if you tie this fly and you forget to put the loop on it completely. <laughs> How often do you... Do you find yourself actually changing a hook out? I mean, is it? It's not really common. Um, although I do, what I do find more often than not, and where it really comes to play for me, is that I um, will recycle the hooks. So I'll actually, when the fly deteriorates, I'll pull the hook off and I'll use it for another fly, provided that it's still sharp. 
that's a good yeah. idea. I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. I find myself, yeah, like man, I'm, flies falling apart. I never change the hook on this. Yep. I like having the, you know, having it swinging free. It's so good for fighting fish. I mean, yep. it's not good for hooking wood, but <laughs> as we all yeah, know. Yeah, and I mean the the, I mean one of the other advantages that you have is that you can, if you do mess up the hook on a fly, you can come back and and put a new hook on it too. So that's another benefit. But for me, and and then there's been you know it's not always easy to obtain bulk hooks these days. So no, sometimes sometimes difficult. recycling hooks is as much of a necessity as it is a yeah. Uh, is a luxury so what hook are you uh using so, these days so for this fly for the bigger flies i use a daiichi tube fly hook size four this is kind of my bread and butter hook on the muskegon and it works like a charm on the muskegon it's a size four daiichi 2450. now this hook isn't perfect for every place if you fish a river that has really low flows then it's probably going to sag a little bit so you kind of have to pick something specific for your river, but for these bigger flies, this is what I use. Um, when we're uh, when I'm trying to fish for for uh, use flies that are good for trout and for steelhead, I might go with a little smaller pattern or a smaller smaller hook, like this octopus hook, which this one's also a Daiichi, but there's good octopus hooks made by a lot of different brands. Sure, uh, but. Uh, the only downside to that is if I'm using this pretty heavy uh, stuff, I really have a hard time. It's a struggle getting that 80 pound through, so I would use the lighter braid for that. So, so anyways, I'm gonna just uh, I'm gonna take my thread and right over the eyes, I'm gonna form an X with it, and I'm gonna cover the shank going back, and then I'm going to bring the uh, thread back up to the front. Now. It's not the most aesthetically appealing, but it sure does make this fly rugged, is that I'm gonna fold over that braid right underneath the eyes where the knot goes, and that way it's kind of tucked away. Nice. And uh, so now we've kind of covered that all up, and uh, that makes this fly pretty much indestructible. You know, when I first started using braided loops, I would not put that knot in there, and then ever most of the time it would be fine, you know. Uh, but even if you put glue on it, once in a while you'd have a really violent take, and then, then the hook and the the fly might still be there, and you're trying to save face when, like a half an hour later, you notice your client's casting a fly without a hook on it. Oh, no. <laughs> like I don't know what happened there. You know? <laughs> must have been that last cast. <laughs> it must yeah. have been. Must have been that rock we had. So, anyways, uh, so this is a a security measure when you're guiding uh, for steelhead swung fly, and Brian knows this too. Is it's a low numbers game, so everything that you do, you want to be as bomb proof as possible because there's nothing worse than working all day to get a bite and then suddenly something mechanical goes wrong with your fly and nobody's happy with that. So, so uh, anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, continue with this fly. I've got a olive colored rabbit strip. Uh, pine squirrel would be good too if you want to make it even easier to cast pine squirrels even thinner and absorbs even less water but i've been using this as kind of a chunky chunky fly i've got about an inch and a half to two inches of rabbit strip here and i'm just going to lay this right on top just like so you don't have to worry too much about the fly being perfectly even with something like this just get it on there lash it in well and now i'm just going to do some kind of uh, f woolly bugger type stuff with this fly and I'm going to take an olive schloppen feather generally the bigger the better and uh, I'm going to take my fingers and I'm going to stroke this out right where the the fibers of the schloppen get a little bit bigger and I'm going to make kind of an X whereas the tip is going this way and the hackles going this way and I'm going to lay it flat on top of the fly so that it's curving downward and I'm just gonna wrap that in give it a snip and it's uh, ready for the next step and I'm going to take emu and emu is a really good natural fiber it's unique there's really no other no other type of bird that has a feather quite like this and it works really good for sculpin bodies that you want to kind of maintain their shape 
uh, especially if you have flash over it, was because it'll keep the fly expanded a little bit. And between that and having some uh, schlopping over top of it, it really keeps the fly from crushing down. And if you're fishing in in current, that's a good thing. So I tied it in. The other feather I tied in by its tip, but this feather I tied in by its butt. Okay, right here. And I'm going to bring this forward to right behind the eyes. Now if you have a rotary vise, you can certainly use the rotary vise to do what I'm going to do, but you just wind this forward. With the Emi, you just kind of watch that it's not getting bound down on itself. But whenever you're tying, you know, I always use one hand to do most of the work. That makes your tying a little bit quicker. And the other hand just carries a little bit forward. Just that part that you can't quite get to. Right behind the eyes, I'm going to tie this off. Like so. I'm going to give it a snip. And I'm going to take that schloppen feather and I'm going to just like you would with a dry fly, you know, if you're using a couple of hackles with a dry fly, how you kind of weave it back and forth. This is the exact same thing, except kind of jumbo sized. And it's a little more forgiving than a dry fly hackle. But, but the idea is we're trying not to bind down the uh, emu feather by winding this schloppen feather through it. And so when you go back and forth, it does that. And you can see that we've kind of maintained both feathers going through this. Like so, and I'll give it a little bit more. And then I'm just going to tie it off. And there we go. Um, you know, sculpins tend to be kind of a yellowish color underneath. They're kind of a creamy, pinkish color. Um, so I typically use a couple colors to kind of set this fly off. Um, I use a gold flash like this. And then I use a chartreuse colored flash, which is kind of a light green. And that kind of sets this fly off. It seems to be what's working really well this winter. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of gold. You don't want to use too much. This, you know, I I know what flashy flies are. And this, this we want to be. I feel like we should call attention to Kevin saying you don't want to use too much here. <laughs> uh, because I, I, I'm doing a double take. <laughs> You won't hear that very often, and we'll have a fly later on that's uh, a whole theme park of flash. But um, typically with a sculpin fly, I'll try to keep this mostly on the top of the fly, like so. So I just tied in a few strands, and I folded it back. And I'm going to give it a snip. And then I'm going to use this lighter green, more chartreuse. Um, I'm not sh I have a, use a variety of different brands. That works great. The Hedron um, Fire Tie works great for this fly. Uh, and I'm just going to tie this on top of the fly, like so. And anything that's left, because I'm a pretty cheap guy, <laughs> we're going to try to use it all. We don't, we don't want any good flash to go to waste. So this is where we're at with this fly. Um, Kevin, have, what, what would you say the length overall is so we're the, at right now. This is going to be about a three and a half inch to four inch fly. It's okay, perfect. Just a to get a, bit, a, a gauge on that. Yeah, yeah, some scale for people watching. For what I do swinging these days, that's towards the big end, but I do like this fly. A lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll keep one of the clients fishing something big like this while the other one I have fishing a little more civilized size fly. So I often use this, this it's called Kraken dubbing. It's uh kind of a mix between a, um, uh, a, a fibrous dubbing like ice dub and, uh, and uh, a lot of um, uh, rubber fibers. So it's a, it's a really good thing for a head of a fly because it really keeps the fly from collapsing at the front. So uh, I'm just going to give it a little, in order to make this go all the way around the hook, I'm going to put a clump of it in there. And I'm just going to wind it around and then come up the other side, like so. And I'm going to give it a snip. And I'm just going to take my fingers and push it back a little bit. And if I wanted to, I could add even more if I really wanted a bulky fly. But this is about right for what I'm doing. And then just to keep everything moving along, 
I've got this barred marabou here. Um, this is an olive and brown. If you didn't want to have barred marabou, you could use olive or a gray olive marabou would work great for this fly or even a tan. Um, but if you have this, this is a really nice product for sculpins. And all I'm going to do, because I want all these fibers to be even, I'm just going to take them out and I'm going to hold them so that, see how when you hold it level like this, they all are the same length below the feather. I'm going to pinch it with my finger and just pull it out and you see that keeps all of these about the same length. And all I'm going to do, you know a lot of people think you know when, when you're using a feather that you want to use always use the full length but you can use marabou to be a short length too and you just simply use half the feather and so I'm just going to get it so that it just covers the head like that and I'm going to give it a couple turns and I'm going to leave a little tuft there at the front and then I'm going to take my thread like so and I'm going to finish off my fly it's delicious nutritious delicious and nutritious <laughs> iron supplement uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that yeah Hey, what was that? The do you remember the name of that flash again? Um, so a, a lot of times I use fire tie. Um, I use and that's a hedron product. I yeah. also use Northern Lights flash, which is by a different supplier. Um, I'm kind of a connoisseur of flash, so whatever <laughs> whatever works. But uh, I think this uh, this this flash here is by Fly Tires Dungeon, which is another uh, manufacturer. So. Um, so uh, that's our first fly. Awesome. Uh, Who makes that? That uh, I think it was called Kraken. Dub? Kraken. That's also that same place. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. Fly tires dungeon. It looks awesome. It's it looks kind of like uh, yeah the hairlines fusion dub, but with rubber with, legs. With, ru nice. with long rubber legs. I like the hairline stuff. I just wish it had longer fibers sure. to it for the legs. So. Yep. Um, so, anyways, this is what I found, and it it's really nice. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so that's our first fly, and, and and the name of that once again is the uh, the toad, toad breaker. Yes. Toad breaker. Yes. Toad breaker. And like uh, then we'd put a hook on the end of it just by making it like so. Now, an interesting thing about this fly is that you can you can tie it so that the hook is free, which is what I do for swinging. But if you wanted to strip this fly, you could certainly pierce it through the rabbit. And it would be pretty versatile. So, I mean, and it's definitely something that the fish will eat. You know, it's something... I like having flies like this because I can switch between seasons pretty fluidly. You know, I can switch from swinging flies to steelhead to maybe stripping a fly for trout and still have a use for this fly, whereas I don't have to throw it in a box until the next time. Well, I think so. that's a great tip about the piercing the rabbit Absolutely. for stripping it instead of losing or leaving that hook swinging free that's something i certainly haven't thought about so i've seen it where they lash it right to the rabbit yep. with thread too yep and you can put it through the rabbit if you really want it to be secure you can put a little uv glue or mm -hmm. zap a gap on it um it's all good sally hansen's what kind of whatever are color you, you like are you fishing these days you know i i've gone through a lot of different lines right now i'm using uh, i'm mostly using the triple density reel lines right now but I also run some Skagit's, a variety of manufacturers. So on that triple density, are you putting T14, T11, T8 off the yeah, end Yeah, typically T4. I mean, when I'm using that line, it's to get things down. So okay. it's always T14 at the lightest, yeah. And then you're just running, because that's an integrated line, the triple density. Well, right? y yeah, there's, well, no, there's a, you, I think you can get it either way. I tend to buy the one with the... With the head. Separate, yeah. It's just I believe the head, it's the game changer. That's I believe what it's the called. Name, the game if changer, that's yeah. if that's helpful for anyone out there, but I very but, good line. Yeah. If you're fishing a big river, I mean, it's a big river line. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the intermediates that are on the market work just fine too. Um, I have little nits with some of them, but they're they're all good. So, um, so that's my first fly. Cool. Nice. All I'm going to change. I'm going to change one thing while we we transition real quick, but I will mention. The form is up and running. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Uh, it's the first link in the video description that you're watching. 
and uh, just put your email in there, and we'll hook you up with the book, which is pretty cool. So nice. thanks for donating. Yeah, that. big oh, thanks to Kevin pleasure. for yeah, for guys. that. And Overly if you don't win, generous. we do have them available here at the shop. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Perfect. You like that? Nice. <laughs> Before we go promotion. too much further, we are all in debt to my wonderful wife Annie tonight. Uh, I was. I did, was not prepared and forgot the soundboard at home, and she drove oh. it in to us. So. Yes, yes. Thanks, Andy. I know she's yeah. watching. She's right. waiting for that shout-out, mm. so I didn't want to forget. So. Yes. I. All right. Are we? Do yeah. I keep rolling? You can keep rolling. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of slowly work towards the next fly. Um, I've got uh, four more that I'm going to do, unless they uh, get tired of me <laughs> talking. So... Uh, I'm going to uh, tie a more of a tradition, uh, a fly that I've had for a couple of years, just in a color that works really well dur uh, during the winter months. Uh, this is kind of my winter code breaker fly. Um, so named because I was having a hard time catching fish, and I came up with this fly and it broke the code. So nice. <laughs> I'm a simple man. So <laughs> love it when you can crack the code. <laughs> so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to get this to going here. Um, let's see. Here's the winter code breaker. And I'm going to show you guys how to do this. There's going to be some similarities to, uh, to what you do. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can add weight to a fly like this. Um, you can add, add uh, weight underneath it with a bead chain or with lead eyes. Um, you can also get creative, and if you go find the right thing, like I've found these flat beads that have a little wider opening, and uh, I don't always use them, but on this type of fly, I sometimes use them, and the reason I use them is because a lot of these shanks have this little part here that's really hard to get a bead mm -hmm. or cone over, but this just happens to have a little bit bigger opening, so I can move that all the way up to the front. So there's plenty of stuff out there. You can always find it. Um, uh, this is called a rondelle bead, and I shamelessly shop at craft stores for things like that. But uh, anyways, if you like your weight at the front and you still want to use a shank, this is a really good, simple way to do it, too. So, And that's sometimes how I weight this fly that we're going to do. Uh, but I'm just going to... That's just a little bonus of me going on a tangent. So I'm just going to tie this fly. This is, again, going to be on a 55-millimeter shank, although... Um, I oftentimes will tie a smaller version of this with a 25 millimeter shank, which is about half the size. And uh, that's especially effective uh, as you go into the spring and the fish are feeding on fry. Uh, I can tie a little gray code breaker like this and works really well. But when I turn over rocks in the winter months, a lot of the, um, a lot of the minnows have kind of a bluish hue to them. For some of them, it's a natural thing, like with some of the darters. Uh, but even the gobies and the sculpins kind of appear a little more blue. Probably a lot of that has to do with the winter light coming off the, the rocks. But, I mean, it's, it's a true thing that fish like a little bit blue in their fly, and so a lot of my winter stuff has at least a hint of blue to it. And that's what uh, this fly will have as well. So... This one I'm going to start with the thread a bit further back. Okay, it's going to be two thirds the way back of the hook, and I'm going to bind some eyes underneath it. Again, you can use whatever your choice is for eyes. For me, this kind of uh, six millimeter bead chain is kind of a six millimeter bead chain is kind of a standard weight of uh, of an eye now. Uh, if I want this to, in the winter time, a lot of times I'll fish this around trout uh, as well as around steelhead. And if I'm trying to catch just steelhead, you know, I'll go with that heavy braid that I showed you before. But if I want it to catch trout and steelhead, I'll probably use a little smaller hook. Or if I'm fishing really slow water, I might use a little slower, smaller hook because that big hook that I showed you on the previous fly will sag like we kind of touched on earlier. So I'm going to use this thinner um braid for this. And what pound braid is that? This is uh, 50 pound. And uh, 60 pound is really kind of an ideal. I have 50 and 80 with me. 80 is great for the big big hooks, especially this uh, Power Pro because it just doesn't, at 80 pounds it's pretty stiff. It's almost like wire. So, um, so 
I'm just going to take this just like we did with the other one. Just going to do a little overhand knot. The smaller the braid is, the easier it is to work with on the vise. But uh, of course, that's uh, that's a mixed blessing because it can also foul a little bit easier, although this stuff is pretty good. So I go in from underneath. I bind it down like so. And I bring my thread forward. I pull the remnant back. Tuck it right in front of the eyes. And it's nicely covered up. Okay, and now I've left enough room there for my little bit smaller hook here, which is going to ride, probably going to put a point up here. Um, but again, you want if when you're making your loop, you always want that loop to be at least as long as the hook. But you don't want to get too carried away. You don't want the hook way back here either, because not only will it miss fish, but the longer the loop, the uh, more likely it is to foul up when you're casting. And right, We've and all fish will that. still eat it when it's fouled up, so <laughs> it can be really frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, probably it's probably helpful to. Head you know, if you're just doing a few of these, maybe tie one and have it right there so you can right. be try and be consistent, right? Yep. I mean, that's, yep. I'm sure you've tied so many of these, you can do it in your sleep, you know, <laughs> it, you know, at least with measurements and distance yep. between these. So, yeah. And if you're tying a lot of swung flies and you're going to be using the same fly, you know, get an idea of how long of a loop you want to do. And it's really easy to sit down and just mass produce these at the table to be used later and it makes your tying a lot quicker to make like 20 of these at a time and then use them all at you know in a sure. sitting or whatever so and i have uh, basically a bucket full of them right here but i wanted to show you guys how to to actually make the loop so so i've got that um my next trick here is i'm going to take um some uh some flash now you can buy flashaboo mirage especially the saltwater version and it works great i'll be perfectly honest that this is uh easter basket fill flash or whatever you want to call it it's it works really good and most of the stuff i buy is like stuff i buy at a store but this is just a really good material for not much on the dollar and it's become kind of indispensable for some of my steelhead flies but also for some of my smallmouth flies which is really how i started using this material so so I'm gonna tie this in at the tail okay I'm gonna fold this over like so and I'm gonna give it a snip um, so like I said I'm using this type of flash another really good option would be what's called flashaboo mirage fringe which comes in a little hank and if you use that you'd probably want three or four fibers for this fly um, so a lot of times in the winter I'll use kind of a dark olive color like this. This dark olive is really nice. Um, you know, I haven't found a better craft fur than uh, the hairline stuff, although there's a lot of different craft furs out there, but this tends to maintain its quality really well. Um, but you, you, can't get, you can't get cheetah print like I've seen at Michael's. So, <laughs> well, you know, if true. Caroline's listening, yeah. let's do that yeah. thing. Why not? Yeah. Uh, I don't even know, want to know what you're doing. Yeah, I print. was going to say. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't buy it. I just thought alone. it was interesting. You know? <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need to put that back in your closet. <laughs> yeah. Cheetah print we'll take it to claw. Cuba next time. See know. if see what Customs thinks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I mean, I used to buy Australian possum wholesale wholesale and you would never believe what gets made out of australian possum on the internet <laughs> so, oh just, just, so i'm just i'm just gonna leave that there uh and i'm gonna just tie this a little bit of um a, a little bit of craft for i'm gonna leave a little tuft right there you know it doesn't always look good to have little chunky parts to your fly but with with swung flies those little chunks give the fly a little bit of action rather than a perfectly smooth uh, body. So, so I am going to take some dubbing now. Um, you can use some ice dub. Uh, olive ice dub works great like this. Um, if you wanted your fly to have a little more 
bulk, you could use some of the dubbing like I showed you before. This is uh, a light olive color of that. Uh, or you could use mohair, which works great, olive mohair. I'm just going to use a little bit of this light olive uh, cr Kraken dubbing again here. And I'm going to just tie a little bunch in. And I'm just going to fold it back on the fly. And I'm going to give it another little, just a little bunch of this. And it's okay to have gaps in your fly. The fish really, they don't really care <laughs> much. So, so, so this is what we have so far. We have a a tail, and we have a, um, a craft fur, and then we have a little bit of body material. I'm going to use a couple of uh, mallard flank feathers on this. I'm going to use blue dyed to give it that winter coloration a little bit. Okay, I'm just going to take it. Much like we did um, with the schloppen earlier, I'm just going to take it. I'm going to actually put one of these for this longer version of this fly. I typically use two mallard flanks. Um, but when I tie the shorter version I was talking to you about, I just would use the front one. And, and you'll see me do that in just a minute. But Are those just standard mallard flanks, Kevin, or are they the, yeah, these the bigger aren't the, select ones? The select ones are much nicer when you get them. I, and uh one of the flies I'm going to tie has that select mallard flank, but... They're uh, much bigger, though. Much bigger, Much yeah. bigger. And you only get usually, I think, six or eight a pack. Yeah, they are so. really, really nice. But, yeah, you're right. The pro it's it's one of the other things that's hard to get is mallard flank. And yeah. if you have a friend that's a duck hunter and you like to tie flies, I highly recommend befriending that person. But it only costs you a six-pack once in a while. Might, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I pay. <laughs> yeah. Very smart. Very, that's that's very wise, yeah. So I've just added a little bit of this hackle, and that little collar is just going to give it a little bit of scrunch protection. Now, um, a lot of times I'll use a ripple lice fiber for this next step, which looks kind of like this. Okay, ripple lice fiber works great. Uh, another option is a UV... Crystal chenille, this is gray, uh, but also purple works really well for this fly. Maybe that's what I'll use this time around. Crystal hackle, the, or the not the crystal hackle, it's the crystal, crystal, flash. Flash. crystal flash. We'll get yep. to it. <laughs> and you can also use, um, oh, it's uh, ice hair type stuff. Works really good, and it can be anywhere on that dark, light blue to dark blue spectrum for this sort of thing. Um, but I'm just going to tie it in. I'm going to actually fold this over. I like that. I like the, how that, that crystal good. flash stands out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I really, I kind of thought UV stuff was kind of a gimmick. You know, I'm a skeptic, but I really have come around to it, especially during the winter months. I just almost always throw a little bit of UV material into the fly, and it's usually something kind of in that bluish spectrum. Um, do so, you, do you choose that on on specific weather conditions at all, or just kind of all the time, or usually when there's snow on the ground? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, know, I know we have some guys that it's it's all about light conditions sometimes yeah. more than water conditions, you know. And yep, that was a big misunderstanding when it first came out for me was I thought, oh, dirty water, I want something bright. I think UV, and yeah, I think we've seen almost, you know. Sometimes the opposite, it, and everyone's got their own system. But well, I was it just does curious. vary from river to river in Michigan. Yes. That's one thing. When I write or talk, tell people about the, I mean, it does. There is definitely variances. I mean, when I go and fish the Pier Marquette with Hubbard after fishing the Muskegon all fall, there's definitely color preferences that they have there that aren't, uh, especially during the winter months, are a little different. So, um, but uh, then that being said, these are you know pretty universal flies. So. Hopefully this will at least give you a good scheme of thought. This is a little bit bigger mallard flank feather here, okay? And I'm just going to bind this on down. I've done the same thing. I've laid it flat. I tied it in by the with the tip facing forward. And I'm going to give it a little snip. And then I am going to get some pheasant tail colored ice dub. Looks like this. And I'm just going to give it a little pinch. And uh, this is imitating a little more narrow of a minnow than the previous fly. So I'm going to actually dub this onto the thread up here. 
try to keep the front of the fly kind of narrow when you're imitating things like shiners you know uh, a sculpin will have this big blunt head but a sculpt a shiner's head is almost always triangular shaped so so we're giving it that little triangular shape here and now I'm just going to fold my hackle there's a couple different ways to spiral hackle Palmer it forward but I always tend to fold it but if you want a little more sparse fly you could certainly strip half of the hackle and I'm just gonna wind it forward like so it's personal preference but I tend to always wrap away from me I find that I have better tension on the material if I do it that way but I know a lot of people that wind towards them and they seem to do just fine with that too so I know a lot of people that are left-handed too and they're fine so yeah. that's <laughs> Brian didn't think that was funny I tie right-handed I tie right-handed it's, it's wild I'm a lefty it blows too. my mind Kevin's lefty a lot of the cool people are <laughs> yeah most of us are yeah well, now cool. I feel like <laughs> way to go Matt you open that one up buddy <laughs> somebody just said hey you're uh Matt's camera works making Kevin's uh, scissors look extremely <laughs> intimidating. Uh, intimidating, but honestly, they're like fabric scissors. Well, those are the loon scissors, I believe. Yeah. These are the new loon yeah. scissors. They're nice. They're a little bit, little they're bit big. heavy, but the uh, prime scissor. But I, I like them a lot. So, so I've got just one more material I'm going to add to this fly, and it's one of the best flashaboos for winter flies. Um, if you can get a hold of it, this ice blue flashaboo is money for winter steelhead flies. It's also got kind of that UV hint to it. And I'm going to tie a few handful of strands here. That's a bit longer, probably almost twice as long as the fly itself. And I'm going to tie it over and under. kind of going to be how our fly looks and I really like that blend of olive and and kind of UV blue, blue. Yeah. Uh, that's, I would not have thought to necessarily put that olive and blue together yeah because we see tons of black and blue right that's kind of the I standard like hobo spay blue. style yeah. but I like that and I do love blue when there's snow on the ground as well it's kind of like when I'm running pink yarn, that's only when it's snow. <laughs> I know you don't run yarn, but <laughs> blue spay. So there you go. I mean, with blue, it's a color that can really overpower your fly. So if you're trying to keep it imitating something kind of natural, you don't want to get too carried away with the blue. The next fly I'm going to tie is an attractor, and that has a lot of blue. And that's a little different story because I don't really care if it looks like something in nature. So I'm going to tie that. Um, Awesome. That's the winter code breaker right this there. This is the winter, the winter code, breaker. code breaker. Yep. And I'm going to put that little hook on the back of it. Um, like so. See, that's what happens when you get a little older. Your eyes aren't quite the same. I'm surprised you're not wearing readers yet, Kevin. You know I have them, but uh, I, <laughs> I resist. I, I'm in denial <laughs> many days as there. well. So that's kind of how, what we end up with here um, awesome. for a fly. And you can see that, you know, compared to this, where that bigger hook would be, have a little more weight to it, um, it would just ride a little higher in the water column that way. So, so uh, how are we doing, guys? We're doing good? We're doing, We're doing awesome. Great. We got like Thanks, 140 Jeff. people tuned in, which okay. thank yeah. you, everyone, for tuning in. This is, yeah. this is fun. I love doing this. This is, <laughs> it gets me through winter. I don't know about you all, so. Uh-huh. Guys, I'm going to tie another fly. This is going to be kind of a fun, super-duper flashy fly. I couldn't uh, think of what to call this one either, but it came up. The phrase flash mob came up, so that's what it's going to be, a mob of flash. The that's flash perfect. mob. The flash mob. This Love is it. its professional debut. Uh, a, another person told me I should call it a clown shrimp because it's kind of tied like a, a shrimp pattern, but I think flash mob is better, so... So what was your clown joke? Uh, so, <laughs> two 
two sharks are eating a clown, and uh, the one says, "This tastes funny," you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have three little kids. You know, you gotta, you gotta accept that. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to tie the flash mob now. Um, oh, that's a really long shank. I don't think I want that. I am going to tie this on another one of those 55 millimeter shanks that we used for the last two flies. And let's see, the next two flies will be a little bit smaller, but this one's still going to be a pretty good sized fly, although we're going to use the shank a little bit differently. Uh, it's going to have a lot less tail to it. And... Uh, It'll be glorious. So, um, so uh, this fly is going to incorporate a ton of color to it. Hold that up for everyone just to see the color. That's just for this fly. Right. This is, the um, flash mob. It's flash mob. Yeah. It's uh, it's uh, flashy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to get to work on this fly. It has um, just the dubbings are quite. Uh, clown-like, you know, that's going to be the dubbings we use for this fly in large part. Um, and then we're going to have a whole mass of, a whole mob of flashaboo here. Oh my gosh. And we're just going to, we're just going to go wild and crazy with this, so. Um, Do you have like a, a preferred membership to Hedron, Hedron? I, you would think, you would think, but no. Nope. Uh, so, this is, these are our materials by at large. Um, I think I also need a little bit of something else here, but, but that's a pretty good start. Pretty good start. And I'm going to start, uh, whipping this fly out. Uh, much like the other flies, I'm going to tie a, oops, bear with me just a second here. That's what I'm talking about. I am going to tie a, uh, loop onto this fly. This is a fly that I typically, you know, I'm using just for steelhead. Uh, so I'm not going to be too concerned about um, using a small hook. This will be a pretty big hooked fly. I'm going to use that heavier duty loop because with all this flash on this fly, we want there to be the least chance of fouling as possible because it'll be a real mess if you get fouled up with a fly like this. So unlike the other fly, this, this is going to have eyes way at the back of the hook or way at the back of the shank. And you can use any color bead chain for this. Uh, I really like a, kind of an orange bead chain for this fly. Kind of sets it off a little bit. So way at the back of the hook, I'm going to tie in a pair of bead chain, like so. Okay. And you're tying to the, the underside of the chain. I usually do it that way, but it's not necessary. I figure that either way with a, this type of up eye, it's probably going to be upright either way. But, but this will just solidify how it's running in the water in my mind but this fly is going to look about the same from above or below so it really shouldn't matter where you put the eyes on it but those eyes are going to as much separate the two parts of the fly as they are going to uh, actually um, weight the fly so so it's a multi multi-functioning thing so much like I did before I'm going to quick tie a loop. Again, I'm using the back end of the scissors, like so. You know, I would highly recommend just buying a she cheap pair of shears if you're going to cut a lot of wire or a lot of braid, because uh, a, a cheap pair of serrated scissors can really help prolong the life of your scissors. On the bright side, the loons have a unlimited warranty, so... <laughs> There you Thanks. go. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm just going to make this loop like so. Okay, so it's a it's a pretty long loop. I'm going to put her on underneath there. I'm having technical problems. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that happens to. Hmm. Bear with me. No worries. I might have to make another loop. There it goes. All right, so we're going to bring that over like so. And again, I'm going to leave just enough for the hook in the back. So about like that. I'm going to 
do a little figure eight action here. I'm going to bind it down. I'm going to bring my thread in front of this, like so. And then I'm going to fold this under, like so. Yeah, pretty much the same start we've had with the previous flies, although the eyes are significantly further back than they were in the last two. Now, this fly, uh, you can tie a couple different products in for this. You could use that uh, flash I showed you earlier, but for this fly, I really like to use either Flashaboo Mirage Fringe or this uh, Opal Saltwater Lateral Scale. They're both really good products for this fly. And the Flashaboo Fringe is really very similar to this product. It just doesn't have the texture that this product has. So I'm just going to take a three or four of these, okay, and I'm just going to tie them out. This the, I'm going to make these just slightly longer than the loop, and I'm going to use all of the fibers. So it's just going to hang out the back like so. And then we are going to take a few different colors here. It's going to be a whole fiesta of a colors. Fiesta of a fiesta colors. fiesta of colors. A whole theme park. So I'm going to take some uh, orange first, and I'm going to leave that back behind the fly. And it's okay that this hangs back as kind of a miniature, miniature wing. And I'm going to take a little pink, and I'm going to take a little bit of chartreuse. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, but what I'm doing is I'm just um, I'm just laying it on top of the hook and I'm binding it down. And then I'm just using my fingers to stroke what's left back, like so. Okay? Perfect. That's where we're at right now. Now, uh, I'm going to add a little bit of UV material to it. You could use any of the products I mentioned. You could use Crystal Flash or you could use that Wide Flash. Or you could use this really cool ice blue flashaboo that we used on the previous fly. I'm just going to put a little bit of that over the top here. And I'm going to fold it back. And that'll really shine through with that uh, ice dubbing that's back there. And we're going to trim this just short of the tail. And that tail is going to kind of flicker in the current back there. And you'll really be able to see it uh, when you're fishing it. So, now, Kevin, again, why do you move the beads further back just to give it more yeah, action? Yeah, so I, um, I was trying to make this fly so that all the color was in the back of the fly because as you, f when you find when you're swinging, there's days where you feel like they're biting the head of the fly, and that's when I'll run like an egg-sucking leech if I get that feeling. Uh, but there's other days where they're short-striking, so this fly was, the theory was to get them to bite the back of the fly, but... In practice, it just turned out to be a fly that worked good enough that I use it all the time. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, um, so these are those spay hackles that Brian was talking about. It's a really good product. You don't typically get a lot in a bag, but if you really want to tie a good, beautiful fly in the water, these really long mallard flank dark hackles are definitely a winner. So... So I'm going to use, actually use this as a hackle this time around. So I'm going to try to utilize this whole feather. So I'm going to go way to the very tip of it. You know, and before I do that, um, another thing I typically add to this fly that I forgot to mention is I forgot to mention I put some really wide gold saltwater flashaboo on top of this, like so. Oh. And it probably works better to do it at this point. And I might add a little at the front, too. And if you really want to set this fly off, too, you can also use saltwater blue. Um, <laughs> like I said, this is kind of a mob of flash, hence the, hence the name. So I, I got to s kind of see this fly this fall okay. with a client that we share, but he was very reluctant to let me study it <laughs> for more than like 30 seconds. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I kind of did. I was trying to guess on some of this yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Uh huh. 
so I've got this by the tip now, okay? And I'm just gonna, but it's at the very tip because we are gonna try to spiral that hackle all the way through to the front. So if you have a really big black schloppen feather that's really wide and webby, uh, that would work great right in this case too. You'll want some kind of dark dubbing at this point. And uh, I'm pretty sure one of my real talents is to make a mess out of a fly tang area. So I think I, we need to get a separate picture of this. Yeah, I wish, I, this I, wish I had a wide is, shot for this. It it's, is really, uh, this the, looks like my fly tying pinch. The framing home. is perfect here. I've cut everything out so you can't see just the the surface. Okay, it, the, we will the have I knew gets, you were coming. If the so. mountain gets too high, let me know. We so. need a bigger table. You're going to get a picture of this and post it after the, the, uh, this <laughs> the is where, session. This is where Flashaboo goes to die. It. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I love it. Um, so at this point, you can use some black ice dubbing. Uh, you can use, uh, it's called midnight ice dubbing. If you want to give it that extra blue color, lavender works really well for this. Um, so I'm just going to use a little bit of lavender. I am going to dub this forward and a nice I've, I've dubbed about an inch and a half of thread I'm just going to tightly wind that forward to about here like so and I'm going to take that hackle and be very careful with that first wrap so that I don't break it and embarrass myself but I don't have a lot of pride so that's okay if I do but <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just winding that forward and you can see the loose spiral here and that'll just help this f flash which oh yes there's more flash coming um, don't you worry oh uh, yeah don't you worry uh, and I'm just going to wind it to about here so that's what we have so far and uh We've just got a few more steps, and again, you can you can get wild and crazy with this fly, but I do tend to put another strand of this saltwater flashaboo at this point. So like this so. is this is not wild and crazy. Is that what you're and saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not here to roast you. We're having a good time. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> um, so I've got a few more colors yet. I'm going to use some. Uh, I'm going to use some copper. A um, lot of great copper flashes out there. Um, you can use, certainly use uh, Flashaboo, copper Flashaboo works great. Um, this is something that I really, really like. It's called Hollow Sheen. Uh, it's a type of Creolex MFC type product. Um, if you want something that's going to, they don't make a lot of colors of this, but this particular color is really good. So I'm going to just give this a few strands of that. It's definitely a color you can overdo, so you don't want to get too carried away. And I'm going to tie this in so that it's, again, just a little shorter than the tail. And I'm going to go in above. And I'm going to fold that extra bit under because, again, we, we're trying to make this fly so that it looks, like, looks the same from just about any direction for the fish. And uh, just a couple more colors. This is Rainbow Flashaboo. And if you, uh, for years, if you would ask me what the one color of Flashaboo that I would like for Steelhead, this would be, and, and it's still near the top. I mean, I kind of... I wouldn't have guessed that, actually. Yeah, for the winter fishing, for you know, especially, fish. yeah. especially when I go fish a lot of grapefruit-type colored things, this is, this is really good stuff. And I'm going to tie this in, again, a little shorter than the tail. Fold it above and below. I'm going to give it a snip so that they're all about the same length. All right. So when you can picture this in the water, you've got these thinner fibers here, but then these thicker ones are going to be just a little longer, and they're going to just kind of flicker. And anytime you mix gold with any of the opal colors 
or if you mix it with silver you'll notice it really puts out a lot of flash so when those two are together so now I'm just going to take a little bit of chartreuse to finish this fly off wow it does have a lot going on in there <laughs> <laughs> yep and usually the all of this chartreuse I usually just put on the top and that's the kind of the end of the fly here All right. I like the way that body material shows up. Yeah. That's yeah, a good bait. So Almost I usually looks, do better yeah. with this fly with kind of medium weight, so it's not a fly that I use when I really need to dredge. I keep it a little bit higher. Um, it seems like when I put lead eyes on it, it doesn't fish quite as well, but when it has just these bead chain underneath it, it fishes extremely well, so... So there you go. I like it. I like it. I think you, you almost renamed it there, the theme park. I like that. <laughs> That's a good name for That's a fly. That's a good fly name, actually. <laughs> uh, do you like the flash mob? Yeah. Uh, uh. Nice. That's awesome. I mean, uh, it it almost reminds me a little bit of some Western-looking flies that have that squid kind of look shrimp, to it, shrimp, shrimp kind of yeah. look to it. You know, with the sp And the eyes, just like you, you said, kind of set that off and kind of... Make the target the back half of that fly. I like it a lot. That's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. I like what you said about when the fish are maybe taking it shortly, you know, like you're hitting, yep. you know, when they're not, not t attacking the head, right? Um, yep. So that does make a lot of sense. Well, you, you, Brian, you know as well as anybody that even if things aren't going well guiding, you want something, even if you don't think it's what's going to make the difference, you want to be able to change and so even if I have a color combination that's really working, I'll tie flies that are the same color but a little different configuration, and that way I still have confidence in the fly, but I still am kind of keeping things interesting too. So um, so this is a lot. A lot of this is something I'd kind of fish interchangeably. Like if I have a day where I think grapefruit leeches would work well, this has a lot of the same stuff. It's just just different, you know. And it's, sure. Yeah, so... So we're going to gather up all these patterns that uh, we tie throughout this uh, our, our winter our series, time, and we're going to auction them off at okay. the end of at the end of uh, yeah. the season. So we figure we could do some good, some more, even more good out of this. Absolutely, I mean, why not? So and mm -hmm. so you're supplying like a ton here. <laughs> yeah, jeez, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I have a couple more patterns. Uh, these are pretty simple flies. I'll run sure. through these pretty quickly uh and then uh everybody's getting their money's worth tonight so <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> you're the one that has to drive home so <laughs> yeah. no worries kids will all be asleep by the time i'm there either way so <laughs> oh that's a win <laughs> <laughs> awesome. all right um so i'm going to tie a really simple spay fly it's something i use um spay flies have some real advantages not only are they good fish catching flies but they're also very easy to cast um, so I'll always keep some spay patterns if I have somebody that's really struggling to cast. Spay fly is good. Spay flies, unlike the other types of flies I use, I typically don't weight them. I just would use a heavy wire hook. Uh, if the water's low and it's, for example, early fall, I might use one with a really light wire hook. Um, so uh, this one's got heavy wire. I'd feel confident I could use this in, uh, in the winter months. Do you use these as like a comeback fly? So if, if you get a, some That's interest a and, group. you know, you switch up and, and, and present them something smaller. Yeah. It's a great comeback fly. Or I'll, uh, the other thing I'll do is if I have a bright sunny day and it's, the fish are a little bit spooky, I'll have the first person in the front of the boat run one of these on a little longer leader because sometimes I feel like the first person in the front, once the fish see their whole, you know, if I'm throwing that huge sculpin going through first, the person in the front might get the fish, but the person back might. And they're already at a little bit of a disadvantage. Sure, so. absolutely. So um, so what I'm going to do, uh, and I, one of the ways I always, for the type of spay or wet flies that I use, um, they're very simple. I'm not somebody who ties very elaborate spay flies. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this hook with thread. 
And much like some of the other flies that we've used, I'm going to take a few couple strands of opal material. It can, it can again be this, this is that uh, opal lateral scale. It can be flashaboo mirage. It could even be that ice blue flashaboo that we showed you. Uh, but I'm just going to take a couple strands of this. And what we're going to do is we're going to take those couple strands and we're going to tie them in. And we are going to very tightly wind them up the body, like so. Again, one hand's doing most of the work. Flashaboo is pretty rugged, depending on what type you're using, but a fish can pretty easily cut that with his teeth. And if you wanted to do a kind of a more, if you're, if you're in the mood to do it, you could certainly run a copper wire through. What I tend to do uh, that I find works really well is I just take some UV glue and I just go over it like so. Is that thin or uh, flow? This is uh, fluorescent UV. Ooh, clear. that's a good one. And I just hit it with the, the light like so. And now we have a super hard, pretty much indestructible body, you know. I, uh, I was, but another thing, I, I was kind of a late adopter. I didn't really use UV a whole lot, but, but the more I use it, the more I like it. Um, so anyways, it has, there's a lot of things you can do with it that just because of its quick drying and still having a, a little bit of bulk to it, it makes for a great. So, so I've had those two strands. I, I made the body out of it, and then the remnant of it I just made kind of a back wing with this, okay? And uh, I'm going to take another one of these big spay feathers, like so. Now you could, if you want this fly to be sparse, again you could strip half of it. And I was thinking of doing that, but when I looked at this feather, um, I noticed that the side that I like to wrap is actually the, the smaller side, and that's so I'm just going to keep the whole the full feather. So um, I'm just going to bind it in and find a little bit of dark dubbing. Uh, it can be any type of dark dubbing. A lot of times I'll use <laughs> cleaning the table. That's what I'm doing here. <laughs> This is uh, a midnight uh, wing fiber. I'm just going to use this initially as a dubbing, and I'm just going to dub it onto the thread. But you could also use midnight ice dubbing for this. this is, all this is is a little bit longer fibered ice dubbing, and I'm just going to wind it forward like so. And I'm going to take this feather upright, stroke it back, Like so, and and you could fish this fly just like this, and I'm sure it would catch a catch a fish. But um, I always prefer at least a little flash. And this, for me, I either will do a orange and green a lot of times with a spay fly. Um, one of our best colors on the Muskegon is uh, this flashaboo weave right here that's copper, black, and red. And uh, just in the fall, this stuff is like absolute money. Uh, and so I'm just going to take a few strands of this above and below, about as long as the tail, like so. And uh, that fly would fish very well. That I mean, that could be a good, easy, completed fly. These are really easy and kind of fun to tie. And you can easily populate your your fly box with a, several different colors of this in relatively short order. I'm going to use a little bit of this ice blue flashaboo over top. And then we're going to call this fly good to go. And that fly is about done. And 
and I'm just going to finish it off. It's never a bad idea with a fly like this to give it that little coating as well. And that's another thing. I mean, this UV stuff works really good even for making a nice spay head out of it. So I'm just going to hit it. Can we tie these in like twos and fours? Twos and fours, or even this one is actually a one. It's, okay. So um, it's, I know people that use just ginormous spay hooks, but um, this is a good size. You know, once it gets too much bigger, a really big spay hook will do some damage to the fish. So you start thinking about that a little bit. But uh, anyways, that's just a really basic spay. Perfect. I'm going to tie one more, and then I will uh, finish it up for the day, okay? Perfect. Thanks, uh, Kevin. You're welcome. And I'm going to find what I need to find here because it's hidden underneath this stuff. I can't imagine you can find anything in there. <laughs> oh, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I tied this code breaker fly earlier for you guys um, towards spring. I can size parse that down a little bit, um, but I like uh, I like once I get to the smaller sizes imitating salmon fry, a regular hook works just fine for that because it's mostly hook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pink tungsten bead and it's about four millimeters, just a single bead, and it's a tungsten bead and it's pretty easy to use. You can use slotted ones or you can use rounded cup ones, but they're both really good, and I'm just going to put that in. Now, when you use beads, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I can just put the thread behind it like so, uh, and that'll work just great. If, but uh, sometimes there's that big gap behind the head, and if you do that, you would definitely want to use some more glue. Um, but if you're tying a big bead head like this, um, you know, another option is just to take another bead of some sort and run it behind it. Uh, and that'll make it a little easier to dub or, or to uh, bring your thread up snug to it. So I just took a glass bead and I put it behind it. But just personal preference. And all that is is because the hole behind the bead is a lot smaller now, the fly is going to stay together a little bit better. So, yeah. Push those uh, bags down. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. How did that there get you there? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So, uh, so I'm just going to quick whip up this fly. It's a very simple fly. Not much to it. I love guide flies. This is definitely a guide fly. And this, in the spring when you're catching fish bouncing on the bottom, fishing fry patterns, this will work as a swung fly. You catch a lot of uh, steel, steelhead, dropback steelhead with this. Um, I catch trout. And, of course, by, the, by June we're catching... Uh, you know, smallmouth mixed in too. So um, it's something in our river where we fish it when there's suckers spawning where the trout are behind them. Uh, they're eating sucker eggs, but they're also eating fry and things like that. So, uh, so anyways, uh, so very simple, very straightforward. Um, I'm just going to take a, a wisp of um, gray um, craft fur. This is again hairline craft for it's good stuff um, and I'm just going to take a small pinch of this here like so and I'm just going to lay it it's going to be about twice the length of the hook and I'm just going to tie it off one of our great uh, one of the great colors that I use a lot for this type of fly, and a lot of times when I'm tying those code breaker flies that I showed you earlier, is this rainbow crystal flash that looks like this. And it doesn't take much with a fry pattern. They're pretty small and wispy. So, again, a little bit of that. If you're tying it specifically for steelhead, um, oftentimes... I will add a little bit of hackle to it. A good mallard flank feather goes a long ways on a fly like this. So I'm just going to give it a couple wraps. 
Make sure I'm not forgetting anything. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Check your notes. Uh, yes. So I'm just going to take this, and as I've showed you guys before, very simple. All we have is that tail, you know, all we have is that wing. We didn't bother with the body with this fly, and there's really no need for it whatsoever. I'm going to give it a couple wraps of this. Like so. Not very many wraps with this, just a couple. I'm going to bind it down. So we have a very simple fry-ish pattern. Oh, that looks nice. I like it. And I'm just going to take some of this ice blue flashaboo, and I'm just going to tie a little bit over the top. Like so. Anyway, it's very simple spring, springtime swung fly, sometimes the last steelhead of the year I catch on this type of pattern so but it's easy to put in your box and it's very effective so, perfect yep and the tungsten bead will get it to sink quite a bit so if you want don't you're not using a lot of sink tip it'll it'll still get down deep enough with uh, any of these uh, bead type flies I just don't trust it quite as much so uh, I'll even even with that extra bead in there I'll put a nice little coating of glue on it Get it with a flashlight. Now, are you fishing this in, in like, winter-type runs um, um, when you're looking for dropbacks? Or some of them, yeah. Some of them, though, are um, fishing gravelly areas where it, it might take the a trout. The tail outs of but, it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, just a good kind of generic fly to have in the box, something like this at all the time, so... So that's my final hey, marathon awesome. fly. That there. was a marathon session you rocked in it. record time. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, you rocked Kevin. it. <laughs> uh, we did have just a few wrap up questions. If you got I just got a time. moment. Yep. Um, Michael couldn't stay to watch, but he, he wanted to know if you had any tips for working with uh, possum heads. Possum. Specifically in a, the heads. That is a good question. Um, so a lot of working with possum is not, it's not always working with the possum, it's finding the right piece of possum, you know, and when you're looking at the possum that's on the fly shop rack, you want to look for the one that looks really dense, that has a lot of under fur, because that'll definitely make the best head, and if you don't have that, it'll become more of a kind of a scraggly head, and it'll fish fine. It just won't look as cool in your fly box. So, and you'll probably think that you did something wrong. But generally speaking with possum, you know, um, with possum, you would do a lot like what you're doing with a craft fur if you want to make a head out of craft fur. You, you would cover your area with thread, but then you'd take... This is the exact same thing you'd do with Australian possum. You would take a bunch... And you would put it in your fingers, and you would push it down on the hook. And I do that with my right hand, and then I take it with my other hand. Now it's pinched all the way around the hook. And then to make the head, I just I bring the thread off softly up one side, and then as I come around it once, I tighten it down, and that makes it flare, like so. And uh, then we just take our scissors, like this. And if this is possum, it'd make the exact same type of head. And you would just take your fingers now, and you see how that goes all the way around the hook now. Uh, and that's that's uh, Australian possum. Although this is craft fur, but you get the idea. <laughs> right. Well, what I took away from that is, you know, if you're, you got to watch it, how much you're using. Right. And then know that the the base of that material is going to be more dense, and yep. you want to probably. You know, just like you did, you trimmed it. Instead of tying yep. to length, is work those thread wraps on that a little bit thinner material right. and then trim down so that you yep. have the right length in front. When you're using fur, this is craft fur, but it has the same property. If you're using it for the tail, then you want the long fibers. But when you're using it for the head, you can actually pick out some of the long fibers and just use the shorter, denser 
fibers to make the head, and that'll also make it better. I do that with my smallmouth flies when I'm using craft for yep. quite a bit. Yep. So. so. We did have one last question, then we'll let you get oh. on the road. Um, what's What length tips do you usually run in the winter? Well, that's a good question. Off your routes. Um, I'm sure it's conditions it usually right based. In normal winter conditions, it's 10 to 12 feet. Um, it can be T14 if the fish are really skittish. I'll use a really long, thin le- uh, sink tip, like I'll use 12 or 13 foot of T12. Um, uh, if the conditions are such that I'm fishing like fast and slow water, I'll use a short, heavy leader. Um, that might not get super deep, but then I'll add a weighted fly on below it, and then it'll fish at an angle, and that's another option for winter fishing. But um, but in general, it's a 10 to 12 foot sink tip, and it's usually T14. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. If you haven't checked it out, check out Kevin's uh, matching into the mic. There matching bait there, fish. There we can hear you. Look. <laughs> Sorry about that, Matt. Um, but anyway, great book. Um, drops so much information in this and uh, once again Kevin thank you so much yeah big always thanks, a pleasure Kevin. to have you in and uh, we really appreciate it if you get a My chance pleasure. check out Kevin's website um, you know his Instagram he's you know you can even book him for a day and just bug him with questions all he has, a, long, he has so. a wonderful stable of, of good solid guys with, yeah. with great ethics so yeah. we we all appreciate that Kevin big time he's got some great guys working down there on the Muskegon so uh, big thanks to everybody who has tuned in this evening. Thank you. Uh, remember, you have until midnight or whenever I go to bed. <laughs> I'll turn the turn the form off. So I'll be in bed before midnight. Yeah, I should make it sooner. But, oh, well, we're doing it this way. Um, stay tuned. Uh, remember, next week we're doing in-person tying downtown Traverse at Silver Spruce on Wednesday and then the week after I think we have Ed McCoy. Ed McCoy, which All is right, awesome. Yeah. So, be a good one. Um, do you want to talk about film tour real quick? I mean, we oh, got yeah. this audience. So here. we do I have mean. the audience. We uh, we are hosting the fly fishing film tour for 2023 at the City Opera House Friday or excuse me Saturday March 4th. Doors open at six. Uh, film starts at seven. Tickets are available at the Opera House dot org. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks again, folks, for Thanks tuning in. Thanks again for Thank you. all the positive comments for, for yeah. us and for Kevin. So. And support your local fly shop. Yeah. We'll see you guys. Thank you.